if you're trying to figure out how do customer reviews matter, start sharing them across your teams. There's no better way to, I think, to juice momentum for building a program, but there's also no better way to refine what you're producing than to share with your team. And all you're doing along the way is making your company more customer centric. All right, folks, welcome to another episode of the State of Customer Storytelling. My guest today is Cash Walker. Cash is the Senior Customer Advocacy Manager at Netscope, a leader in the secure access service edge space of cybersecurity. He previously really drove customer advocacy at uh, Avanti and uh, Oracle as well. Uh, and for the past eight years, he's been you know, focused and really living in the confluence of you know, building impactful approaches um, to support you know, key business initiatives that, that utilize customers to, to drive those results. Cash, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sam. Uh, that, with that intro, I feel tired. Um, <laughs> it feels like I've been, run, I've been running for too long, um, but it's great, it's great to be with you today. Absolutely. And yeah, in many ways, I mean, you know, customer advocacy is, is really like, it's an old, but also new space, right? So, you know, you could, you could say, uh, you were kind of at the forefront in, in, in many ways, you've been doing it. And, and, and maybe we should start with talking about that. Like, in many ways, it's like, it was sort of, you know, customer advocacy is nothing new, but at the some ways, it's like a renaissance right now, I think, you know, what, in your opinion, what is customer advocacy all about? And, and why does it really, you know, matter? I think you're exactly right. I think, I mean, I, I almost call it customer advocacy 2.0 is what we're experiencing right now. Um, I would say, you know, six, seven years ago, we saw like this first wave of customer advocacy, you know, like get these folks engaged, let's, let's engage with them. And, and we kind of knew that engagement was important. We weren't sure sometimes why um, or, or how to go about it um, and how to, how to handle that. And so you started seeing things like, you know, an increase in case studies, or uh, I think a lot of the customer reviews, especially in the B2B tech space, really started to pop up at that, at that kind of phase. I think now, and I think this is a, is something I've been learning kind of just in a new role, but also I, I always try to kind of reinvent myself is, I think we are seeing people's attention spans have changed. Uh, I think one of the strangest metrics I've ever gotten out of doing customer advocacy is, is one of my highest engagement rates for engaging with customers was, was Friday afternoons. Uh, that goes counter digital marketing across the boards, right? Like, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that people wanted to do some, some of the more engagement based customer advocacy things at the first wave of this, this thing that, that we've been doing on Fridays, because they probably were at a desk probably tired from the week, needed to do something, wanted to do something even, but they weren't going to start a new project. They weren't going to kick something off um, brand new. So, you know, sometimes, hey, we'll give them feedback. Hey, we'll do a customer review. I think that's changed post 2020. Um, I think we've got to be more deliberate and more value driven in, in how we engage with our customers because a lot of folks are, are still at home. And nobody has a Friday afternoon, really. They've got their computer. They've got a dog to take on walks. Maybe some kids that, that they're getting called to take, take you know, control of for the afternoon or, or a dishwasher to unload. So there's not that same space that needs filled by, by engagement. There's still space for value, but we've got to figure this out and reinvent kind of how we go after them because it's, it's new. Yeah, so true, and uh, I, I know I, I know I feel that way, uh, especially with uh, I just have a four month old at the moment, so uh, yeah, definitely definitely feel that. And it sounds like you mentioned the kind of driving value and like kind of a two way exchange of value, right? I think that's one thing that we all a aspire to, you know, as customer marketers, as advocate marketers, is like making that that advocacy program a two way exchange of value. Sometimes it's it's easier said than done. Um, do you have any kind of thoughts on that or tips you could share? Like, what have you learned about like making, you know, advocacy like a two-way exchange of value over the years? Yeah, that's a great, it's, it's really tricky. Um, I think the, the one main takeaway I've had is it starts with sincerity. 
right? Like if you're sincere with your customers about, hey, we want this story to be about you, you can make that statement and it only goes as far as as you are really meaning it, right? Like if the, if the case study comes out and it's, you know, it's nothing about like some of the recent successes, but it's all about the the technical implementation of your product, not a very sincere engagement with that customer. And I think it, it, it even gets as simple as, you know, when you tell them something, you follow through on it. When you tell them, hey, this is going to be a, a 45 minute interview, it stops then. And I think I think that's been the one key because I think there's always unique challenges. Every customer is unique. Um, their approval processes, their their why for why they want to do something is unique. But I think as long as you lead with sincerity, you'll get to that value for them and, and have better outcomes. It's, it's so true. And, you know, it's it's kind of like that common sense thing, but it still bears mentioning because like we can all get caught up in the sort of the strategy and the tactics and, you know, the pressure to achieve results. And so that, that's such a good point. And you mentioned kind of, um, you know, customer stories and obviously, you know, there's there's kind of like the overarching, you know, umbrella of, of, custom, of customer advocacy, which, you know, might include, you know, several other things. Where do you see kind of customer stories, you know, specifically customer stories and customer content kind of fitting into that customer advocacy umbrella? Yeah, I think it's I think it's one of the primary pillars. Um, I think like maybe I think a lot of folks, they get tasked with, you know, customer advocacy looks like it looks like the content, the story piece. It looks like references. It looks like baby groups, you know, like client advisory boards or some of those things some folks might be handling community um, but i think one thing that's that's pretty universal from what i've seen is is that need for stories and and like you said there are there are various ways of getting those i think all of them are important that's the trick is is that you can't just do one and and check a box you've got to get coverage across the board i have my preferences but i think a lot of it goes back to your business. You've got to see what matters to your business and it ebbs and flows. I mean, if you've got a if you've got an analyst need and some reports coming out that if your your company placed really highly, it's gonna be very beneficial. I mean, reviews become a high priority where in general you would see a review being less valuable than getting a customer on video. So I think I think you've got to go where the business priorities go and you've got to you've got to always be mapped to those. And I think that goes not just with your stories, but with your program in general. Um, your program's only as good as the business impact it, impacts it drives. And I think it has to be unique to your business. And I think it has to be always aligned to to your current or, or future business goals. That's such a good point. So it, it sounds like, you know, it all has to, when you go about setting a strategy, you know, that's what you would, you need want to figure that out, you know, in the beginning, right? Like what is the, what, what, are, what are the priorities? What are the key strategic initiatives, you know, and then, and then how, how do you map the customer storytelling needs to that? Is that, is that correct? Yeah. And I think, I think when you look at it, the better, the better program and the more established you get that you've built, you can say, you know what, we're going to pull this lever during this quarter because it's what's it needs to hit the next one, or we've got to do these things. It doesn't make the job any easier. Honestly, it might make it harder, but it's always going to keep things fresh. The thing I like about it, let's say you do a push for customer stories, you get, you get a couple in the pipeline and then you, you need to pivot and prioritize reviews for a quarter or for a month. When you come back to those, you know, your next round or your next push for stories, I hope that each time I've, I've come back with something different. I hope that I evolve as a marketer and I know our company has evolved. And so I hope that that keeps those stories fresh and keeps challenging me to do something new. It's just not a rinse and repeat. It's, it's a great point. And it's, it's exactly why it's like, you can't just forget about it. Cause like, you know, strategies, strategy does not stay, you know, stuck and or frozen and, and that, therefore neither can, can that kind of the stories. Right. So such a good point. Um, I think, you know, what about like identifying, you know, which, which customers um, to actually ask, right? I think there's, that's something it's, you know, and it really, I think it's a unique challenge in, in different companies, but I know some, some marketers, 
they're perhaps like, you know, okay, I want to do, you know, we need to do customer stories. I have a good feeling for, you know, the, our strategic initiatives. So I kind of know who I want to get, but I actually don't know who. It's like maybe the data is siloed over in customer success or in, in sales. Uh, I mean, I know this depends so much on like the technology stack that people use and the kind of the, you know, culture of the organization. But do you have any tips on kind of like, actually identifying like who to reach out to, to make that ask to uh, participate in a customer story. Might be the trickiest part of all of this because data on, on these things is, is not something that I think we track at a great level to say like, this customer has a great story. There's indicators. There's indicators that you can follow. If, if you do, let's say, go through, go through your customer reviews. If you do have a decent amount of customer reviews, Look for leads, right? You've got to you've got to handle your story pipeline the same way you look at marketing. Create a lead funnel. Know where you can get these leads. It's, yes, your your client advisory boards, your executive advisory boards, great, great leads, right? You're probably going to get more likely to get a yes out of them. That doesn't mean they have a great story all the time. So then you also want other lead sources that are that are potentially going to bring you stories. Maybe it's some of your beta tester group. Maybe it's some of, you know, your your lower tiered customers. A lot of times smaller customers do really innovative things with your product that sometimes the enterprises they don't. So I think you need to kind of build it like a a lead funnel and be capturing those folks at different different stages and from different sources because sometimes that creates new stories. If you're only getting your sources uh, from sales, you're going to get a lot of implementation stories. Those are great, but they only go so far. So you got to vary your lead sources. Yeah, that's that's such a such a great point. And it, it is like sort of, uh, you know, obviously, we want to make all in all a two way exchange of value. But it, like you said, it's not too dissimilar from like a sales process. You're just kind of selling your customers on the, the value and hopefully it's a two-way exchange of value of participating in those stories. How about approvals? Because that's I think that's another thing people, yeah. you know, and it's specifically like legal approvals, whether it's like before or, you know, after reviewing things. I think that's something that a lot of people, you know, kind of have to navigate and, and frankly is can be really hard at when you're trying to feature like a larger company. Um, do you have any tips for people who are like, just feeling maybe overwhelmed or, or kind of by the, def- the fact of like, okay, like I have this customer, but like, I know it's going to be crazy to approve anything they say or, you know. Yeah. I learned this pretty early in my journey. I had a really, really great story. Um, I was like so excited about it and <laughs> it just got blown to shreds by legal. And I was just like, I remember sitting there just like shell shocked um, thinking like, well, how could this happen? Um, you, you live and you learn, right? And I think there should probably be a, like a, a support group spun up for those of us who chase these because it, it is a difficult process and it is you, sometimes a very long process and, and other folks don't understand, right? If they haven't chased approvals on these, they just don't get it. They're like, why can't we get our biggest customer with the sexiest logo to go on record? <laughs> and you're sitting there like, I don't know. I would say get get the get the company um, and not just the customer, right? Like, so if you're if you're working through IT or you're working with a, a CISO, get their stakeholders involved early. Talk to them about what type of story will get approved. What, what does the end product need to look like to be that exchange of value, both for them personally and for their business? And then work consistently with their teams to have them involved. I mean, how many, I asked our PR person a couple months ago, I said, has anybody ever came to you and said, hey, would you sit through this interview process with me to help me to produce the story that's best for Netscope? And she was like, that is not something I normally get approached with. Um, And I think that's something that we can always do better is get their right stakeholders involved. Just what you're doing is you're lowering the barrier or lowering the hurdle that you're going to have to to eventually jump. And yes, you will eventually have to leap over, but you're trying to make that less of a step as possible in the future. And I think if you've crafted the story so that it's something that they're motivated to share and that is in line with their 
brand that is in line with things that they've produced in the past. A lot of times you can figure out what, what can be produced by seeing what else have they done and doing those kind of things makes it easier, but it's, it's going to, it's going to still remain challenging, but those are some of the better approaches, I think. Yeah. That's such a good point. Like in, you know, kind of collaborative approach, right. You know, figuring out, you know, working with them early rather than at the end, you know, kind of coming in and hoping, you know, that it kind of, uh, you know, all works out, right. You know, again, simple, but, but such a, such a thing that is very easy to forget, you know? And then in terms of, I guess you mentioned customer advocacy, kind of advocacy 2.0 earlier on. I'm curious what, what other, you know, if we were going to kind of outline, if maybe draw a distinction between advocacy 1.0 and, and advocacy 2.0, you know, what are the big, you know, hallmarks of advocacy 2.0 versus advocacy kind of 1.0? And I'll actually, you know, start by contributing one. And I think reference calls we're seeing in advocacy 1.0 is very reference call driven. In advocacy 2.0, we're certainly not, you know, reference calls are not going away completely, but we're seeing um, a lot of reference need for reference calls being deflected by better uh, customer content, better customer stories, whether it's, you know, video, often video. And um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there though. I'd love to hear, yeah, where do you see those kind of distinctions between customer advocacy 1.0 and, and 2.0? I think just to your point, um, to build off of that, it's customer advocacy 2.0. Now that I sit here and think about it, it's probably all about time. And by that, I mean, your advocacy asks need to be more ironed out. They need to be more in line with where the customer's at in their process, but even simple things like the reference, right? The more, more references you can deflect, the better your program because you're saving the advocates time. And I think we have to look at it as how much time are we asking from these advocates? What are we, what are we giving them in exchange? Because I think if I, if I really look at it from a broad view, time is the biggest limiter on where we're at. And respecting their time and and even in even in appreciation things right like i'm not sure gift cards go as far as they used to <laughs> i'm not sure if somebody gets a ten dollar you know card to their favorite joint to grab a drink or to put towards their next online purchase i don't i don't know if those move the needle in the same way they might have um because i think you and i and our customers we've put a, a more of a premium on our time yeah, that's it's such a such a good point, and so it sounds like, you know, there's more of an emphasis in, on, you know, maybe doing sometimes a, a slightly more, you know, a one-time upfront investment, but a, like a more scalable thing long term, right? Is is that is that fair to say? Like, yeah, I think that I think that's hitting it right on the right on the head. I think you've got to get more out of everything you do with them. If they do a customer review, that's awesome. It's going to get you this. You better develop a template for those reviews so you can feature them on your website. You better be sharing those reviews in social. You better be gleaning those reviews for product insights. Don't throw away any of the value they've given you. Maximize it. And, and if you do a video interview, transcript it. Turn it into written quotes. Even as simple as when you do have a customer quote, log it. Have a source of truth, have a database that you're going back to that you're able to say like, hey, here's this quote. Hey, here's this case study. Don't lose any of it. You just you can't afford to. Yeah, that, that, that's so true. And you mentioned uh, video reviews, case studies. I'm curious. Yeah. How do you think about, you know, the different sort of the different mediums, you know, for customer storytelling? You know, obviously the big three being, you know, written case studies, third party reviews, or at least from my perspective and customer videos and maybe, I don't know, analysts reports as well for enterprise companies. But yeah, how do you think about kind of those different mediums and also within the context of like, you know, advocacy 1.0 and advocacy 2.0 and kind of where things are trending? Yeah. And I think, I think there's a whole new opportunity, especially when it comes to video. I remember, I remember back in the day, one, one summer I did like, I don't even know, it was like 15 to 20 video trips. And I was basically on the road for the entire summer visiting customers. It was a young man's game, but, um, Nowadays, right, I think with with people accustomed to looking at Zoom, to being in front of video, and I think that's that's almost more of it. It's not necessarily they're willing to consume a less produced video because I think they they probably always were. 
I think, and you still want your videos to look sharp. You still want them to be on brand. Like, yes. But does everyone facilitate a massive video shoot at the customer? I'm not sure. Um, that's probably up to your brand. But I think people's willingness to be on video has probably gone up a bit. Although I don't know they would admit to it. <laughs> they're, they're com- they'll be more comfortable, right? I, I remember interviewing a, 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 I mean, this guy was massively successful. He owned, you know, in this is back, I don't even know how long ago, eight years ago. Um, he had done, I mean, he owned multiple, I was in automotive, so he owned multiple car dealerships and he was successful across the board. I'm sure he had done advertisements. I'm sure he had done promotions. Um, they were in a major metropolitan city. He was completely uncomfortable being in front of a video camera. I would have never known this before arriving, but it was a hurdle we had to overcome in a drastic way. Um, I think people are more used to seeing themselves staring back at themselves nowadays um, via Zoom. And so I think you can use that to your advantage to some extent. But I think videos have got to be probably shorter, right? Like we keep we keep going that way. I think they've got to stand out though. I think I think the challenge is creativity. You've got to make everything you do more direct to the thing you want to drive. Like a video does no good if it doesn't hit on any of the things that that it needs to. You've got to focus on your outputs, right? Like what's the customer going to get out of this? What's it going to what's it going to do for them in your funnel? What's it going to, you know, what's it going to do for your prospects? What's what stage is it served up in? Um and as you get more linked, then I think the things matter, but you've you've got to allow them to. Yeah, uh, a couple of things I want to you know drill down into there. Like I think the whole <laughs> the funny point. It's true. It's like people are I think especially from the comfort of their own home. You know, way more comfortable going on going on video just because of of you know the the sort of new normal that we all live in, which which is which is a great thing. And there, thankfully, also like you know you mentioned Zoom. Um, you know, obviously there's that that's one way to do it. And there's also other other ways to even you know do it higher quality. Obviously, that that's what we do remotely, and you know filming through through iPhones or you know Android devices, which are just crazy. That like the quality like on smartphones today, the video quality is just bananas, and it's not slowing down, right? Like uh, every every new phone release, it, we were getting closer to that like DSLR quality in a smartphone. If you can you know actually you know capture that. Uh, interview from home via a smartphone. Of course, you know you have to edit it uh, and all that, or, or work with a, a someone who who's going to help you do that. But you have like a, a fidelity that that's like homepage ready for even like you know you know any company. So I think that that is like uh, I, I agree. I think we're still going to see like for like a marquee customer, uh, you know, there we're still going to see you know on site you know videography, and, and that's still what we see. But I think the whole like remote video is just becoming at an extremely high quality is becoming so more viable. Yeah, especially for the interview, right? Like I think like there's always, it's funny because like when you first start doing these, you're like, ah, oh, we got to get B-roll. Ah, oh, we got to get B-roll. And, and that's always like the afterthought. But like some really snazzy B-roll goes a long way. <laughs> so I mean, that's probably the, diff- the drop off, right? Of not having somebody in person um, is not being able to get some of that and get like the engagement side it's hard to have a personality when it's like standing in front of a wall and no, no moving shots, no alternating camera angles. Um, I wonder if we'll go back though. I, I wonder, I wonder where we are on the pendulum and, and if we'll start to go back to people like wanting to see, you know, I think we're starting to see that people want to go to events um, as it becomes safer and, and safer. I, I wonder if we'll see people wanting to consume a, a little, a little more, fully produce stuff or, or have at least a mix of it. Yeah. I think, I, I think it's a mix just like, I think like events, you know, like now it's like hybrid events. Right. And, and I think with the, with the content we're going to, you know, cause there's always, you know, if you're going to, if it's like a customer video on your homepage, you know, it does need to be, you know, higher produced, whether that's like a higher produced remote or on site. And then of course there's always, um, you know, an opportunity for that more like rough and ready stuff that isn't, you know, on the homepage, but it's still, you know, super valuable. Um, I want to circle back on something you said earlier about kind of just making it, the video or, or, or really the any medium, the, the customer content, you know, appropriate and, and what customers actually want, specifically the, what they want at um, that stage of the buyer journey, right? Like, you know, it sounds like what you were kind of advocating for and, and, and I would agree is that like, 
you know, it's not maybe 1.0 was like one size fits all case study. And, and like 2.0 is like, we're going to actually figure out, map the buyer journey, figure out like all this different micro content, customer content, but it's going to change based on like where people are in the buyer journey. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think, I think previously, I mean, I know my, my, at least my first interviews I started doing, you would do like, I mean, it feels like they were 15 minutes long. I don't know how long the videos ended up being right off the top of my head, but it seems like they were long because they captured everything. I think you still like to make the most of the customer's time, you still capture everything, but you produce it in a different way where if somebody wants to consume an implementation story, you have that, you have that there as a, as a piece, they can consume it, allow them to tell you they want more and continue their journey to digest more. But if that's all they wanted today, great, give it to them to get that out of. And I think that's the piece it's, it's once again, like none of these things are overly easy. But I think it's what we have to be aiming for. Yeah, it's, and, it, and it's so much more in line with, I think, how all buyers want to kind of consume content today, right? They want that, they want that kind of snackable experience um, and kind of self-service. Uh, that makes a ton of sense. And, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm a marketer who's listening to this and I'm like, I, I love the, all these ideas that I'm, I'm hearing and I want to kind of, I feel like I'm not there yet. I'm, you know, I want to kind of catch up in terms of my, you know, customer advocacy and, and my customer stories. What advice would you give someone who feels like maybe they're they're like a little bit behind or like they they haven't just done this yet and they want to catch up and get started? What what kind of advice would you share with them? So I would experiment internally, and by by that I mean if you're trying to figure out how do customer reviews matter, start sharing them across your teams. Start start just publishing them in Slack. Come up with a channel. Throw up your customer reviews, share them with your team. If you if you're trying to figure out how do we make these customer videos better, I've got some I've got some customer video we captured. Share them with your team. Um, there's no better way to I think to juice momentum for building a program than to get your internal buy off. But there's also no better way to refine what you're producing than to share with your team. And all you're doing along the way is making your company more customer centric. So experiment internally, like trying to figure out, you know, a new case study template, throw a couple together and share them across your team. I think sometimes we overthink it and we think it's got to be this big produced, you know, it's got to be a change to the website. It's got to be front page. It doesn't throw it up on your intranet, throw it in your newsletter, um, get it in front of folks. All you're going to do is get questions, get feedback, get input from your team, which the collaboration drives the success of your program. And you're going to be making people understand your customers through a better lens, the more you do that. So yeah, I would say experiment internally. I think it's been huge for me. And I think sometimes we get in such a hurry to produce for external that we, we don't do that. And even if you're doing external already, pump some of that back internally. Mm, such, such a good point. And, you know, it sounds like, you know, getting feedback from, you know, your, even, especially maybe your sales team, right? If they're using those those um, customer stories in real life situations, you know, if you can ask like, hey, like which one of these is, is working? Which, uh, you know, what points are hitting the most? And it, just from a pure like time, like feedback, you know, it seems like that that conversation and that that open dialogue between sales would be extremely helpful. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can, <laughs> I mean, career-wise, if you can produce what your sales team needs, you're golden <laughs> like that. That is a job in itself. Um, so it's good job security. If you can, if you can get the right sounding boards and involve them and celebrate them. And, and what I love to do is, is, you know, like if I do that and I have this really great salesperson and he helps me come up with this process and I launch it when I launch it, I don't even talk about what I've launched. I talk about his idea because that facilitates more people feeding into what you're trying to build. I want, I want to shift gears to talk a little bit about kind of cybersecurity as well um, within the context of, of everything we've been talking about. You know, there's, there's, of course, you know, interesting paradox, I think, with the cybersecurity industry where like uh, it's very peer driven customer stories uh, and are, ex, you know, especially valuable, but especially hard to get at the same time because uh, being the security industry and privacy concerns and 
security risk concerns. And yeah, what I guess um, you, you've worked in a number of different industries, but what have you sort of learned there so far? And, you know, maybe you can just kind of speak to that sort of that, that managing that, that dichotomy. Yeah, two of the last three stops were in security and the other one was Oracle, right? So I haven't had necessarily the easiest path to, to approvals and simplification when doing these things. Um, it definitely is a challenge. I mean, if you don't acknowledge the challenges there, then you're being unrealistic with yourself. The value, like you spoke of the content, has, has only increased. I assume that's for most, that's for most verticals though. I think you just gotta go back to. I always go back to like banks, right? Like nobody's gonna do a testimonial from from a bank and tell you how they which which vault they're using, right? They're not gonna they're not gonna tell you this new security procedure they implemented as part of their part of their closing process at the end of the day that that makes their their bank safer at night. Um, nobody wants to give you that information. And so what you what you've got to do is you've got to talk to them about efficiencies. You've got to talk to them about being a leader. Um, you know, if you go down to the, you go down to that bank and you talk to that bank about, you know what, you guys are a leader in keeping costs down for your members, but providing the best level of security for their money. That's a story for them, right? Like what credit union or what local bank wouldn't want to be mentioned like that? They wouldn't be able to be want to tell their customers, yeah, we're driving down, we're keeping our costs down while providing you the most elite level of protection. That's a great story. And it's equally a great story for whoever the provider is that's providing that. So I think you've got to get to that level that um, everybody knows what you're speaking about, that, that you're involved in their success, but you make it, you make it a matter for them. And I, I think it kind of goes back to a lot of the other things we've hit on. But yeah, it's, it's always challenging. Mm, I, I love that. It's such a good point and it relates to like, how do you make the ask, right? It's all about that two-way exchange of value. And one of those ways is for sure, you know, shining a light on the on customers and, and companies to, you know, help them build their, you know, in actually in individual people that are giving the the testimonial or the, the video and you know, helping them build their reputation and their career. Um, I think that that, that, that can be a, a lot of the value of of participating in these things. Yeah, knowing that is so helpful, right? Knowing like, hey, this person is is bright they are young you'll have like things like they went to mit they did this and you're like all right they're not like you can see it they're not going to stay at the level they're at forever and then you understand their motivators but in some of that you know going into a call right like you'll see it in the lead information or you you'll discover it along the way sometimes i don't discover that until the discovery process but i try to have those conversations with the customers so that i understand what can i help you get out of this beyond your brand, beyond this, you know, what can I help you as a person get out of this? What, what, why would you say yes to this? And how do we make that the end result surpasses your expectations? And do you find that often helping them as an individual kind of build their, their reputation and, and their kind of career? Or yeah, what, what do you kind of see? What has uh, kind of worked there? Yeah, you have some that they want to. And then you have some that they're just doing it because they like your product. They love, a lot of times they love their salesperson or they love their reps. They feel like they've had a great level of partnership. So they want to talk about that. Those are awesome, right? Other times you have folks that they really do want to get their name out there. They want to be known for what they're accomplishing. And so you just, you just have to discover that and then help them hit it. I mean, I always have said my like mark of success is is if we produce a video, I think video is the easiest one, right? Um, to say this for, but if we produce a video, would they be proud enough to share it on their LinkedIn? Great, right? Would they be proud enough to share it on their Facebook where nobody knows what they do for their job, but it would make them feel like a rock star? Even better. Like that's how you know like the different levels you've hit. Like, does this matter to them as a professional because it gets their name out? Great. Is this something they personally are proud of? and excited about even better. I love that. And that's such a good tip. And um, it all comes, I think, yeah, it comes down to generosity, being genuine with what you ask and, and really you know, making them the hero of the story, right? Uh, Cash this has been great. Where can, uh, where can people, if, you know, get in touch with you and if they want to, you know, connect and, and learn more or just, uh, you know, have any other questions? 
Yeah, definitely if they want to commiserate about some of these challenges. Um, no, uh, LinkedIn is a great place to track me down. I would say Twitter, but like that's just me complaining about sports usually. So I won't, I won't, I won't burden anybody with that. But yeah, and I, I, I mean, LinkedIn's a great place because a lot of these things, like if I'm, if I'm working on something, I'm pretty transparent about things. So if, if we're working on something at Netscope, we're work, working to launch a program, um, you can usually tell what what I'm doing or what I'm what I'm building because we'll be talking about it in all, in all sorts of ways, um, both with our customers and with with colleagues. So amazing. Uh, and well, uh, thanks, Cash. I really appreciate it, and thank you for hopping on today. Appreciate it, Sam. It's always good to connect um, and hear what you guys are up to. And it's always it's always fun to talk about these challenges kind of we're all trying to solve. And so I appreciate you having me on. All right, folks, that was Cash Walker. Fantastic episode. Uh, so many nuggets in there, you know, sales funnel approach to getting these stories created, uh, legal approvals, thinking in advance, there, working collaboratively, getting you know, in with the right stakeholders early. We talked about, you know, customer advocacy 2.0 and, you know, kind of contrasting between, you know, the more the the classic 1.0 days and, you know, how with 2.0, you know, actually deflecting, you know, references with great content and the shifts around time and, and how kind of the future of, of advocacy is, is going to be, you know, certainly less about gift cards and more about the most scarce asset that we all have, which is time. Highly recommend, uh, you know, connecting with Cash if you're in the advocacy space. Awesome guy. And uh, again, this is the state of customer storytelling uh, brought to you by Testimonial Hero. Uh, my name is Sam Shepler, and we'll look forward to you checking out the next episode. We publish every week. And if you have any other guests that you really want us to feature, my email is sam at testimonialhero.com. Just shoot me a message. We'd love to hear from you.